What a blessing to be here today. And uh, for those who don't know, yes, my name is Peter Thomas. Myself and my wife, Pastor Sonia, we lead this work, uh, Freedom Ministries International at this time, which includes Freedom Centre here and in other places. Tomorrow we're actually off to a conference for a, a ladies group within our, a ladies funding ministry group within our ministry called Her Hands. And there's a hundred, over a hundred women gathering in Brisbane. We're going to join them from Australia, New Caledonia, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu that are going to be gathering there. For, they're already arriving and we're going to be with them a couple of days this week, praise the Lord. And then I'm off back to New Zealand. I hadn't so much planned any more trips, but off to New Zealand because they're having some commissioning of leadership in their um, church, particularly following and uh, recognising the gifting of the, the five ministries from Ephesians chapter 4. And so uh, I'm going to be going to visit them. So it's, it's, it's a great privilege to serve the Lord and it's particularly great to be here this morning with you and to be, to be serving here today. It was Pastor Neil who would be speaking this morning, but he is not well. And uh, he's really not well. So for Neil not to be up out of bed and in church, he must be unwell. So not something I've ever seen in a long time. In fact, not even the teenage boy liked to stay in bed when he wasn't well. So he must not be feeling well today. So I'd just like us to raise our hands on Neil's behalf and let us pray. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus to the cross to deal with our sin and to deal with our sicknesses and our diseases. It says that he carried them. By his stripes we are healed. And so we speak now to the body of Neil as it rests in that bed. And we say, body, you were healed 2,000 years ago. The fever and the flu and the discomfort that's in your body now, we say, be gone, go away, because Jesus carries you away. He carried our sicknesses. As you took Neil's sin, so you took his sickness. And so we speak to this sickness and we say, be gone and body begin to restore even this very hour in Jesus' name. We restore, we speak restoration to all of Neil's body in Jesus' name. And we command this virus to be gone in Jesus' name because Jesus dealt with it. Jesus carried it. Jesus was whipped for the end of it. And that's what we claim in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we claim. Amen. You know what? As I'm praying there, I feel like the Holy Spirit says, and there's others too here that maybe you're carrying something in your body today. We should pray for that. This isn't just for Neil, it's for all of us. And I would remind you, if you believe that Jesus carried your sin, he carried your sicknesses the same. And Luke recorded in his book, he said there was a parable that Jesus told, and he said Jesus told us this parable so that we would pray and not give up. So there's a certain part of prayer that has got persistence to it. And it's the parable of the, the woman that nags the judge until she does, until the judge does. And the judge says, because of this woman's constant nagging, I will grant her what she says. And he goes on to say, well, your heavenly father loves you. So he's even going to be more quick. He's going to take action more quick. But, you know, sometimes it is a battle to bring into the physical what has been won for us in the spiritual. And we see many examples of that in the, in the Bible. Not, nonetheless, Daniel praying and, and waiting for a month for the answer to come and the, and the angel saying, I've been battling to come because it's called the fight of faith for a reason. And so maybe this morning you're not well, it's recent, maybe there's someone else who's not well or maybe there's something that you're still believing for and it's been a while and sometimes you can kind of give up and come to accept but I would encourage you not to accept this morning whatever it may be ailing you. So if there is something bothering you this morning, I'm not going to ask you to come out but if you would just raise your hand where you are in your seat. Okay, there's quite a few hands. I'm going to ask people to get up and go and lay hands. Keep your hands up. I'm going to ask those around, one or two, to go and pray for each person who has their hand up. Go and lay hands on them. Has everyone got someone laying hands on them? There's some hands over here. Nobody. I do need you to get out of your chair and go and pray. Lay hands on someone. Please do, yes? Okay. Amen. We've got some at the back that are willing to come and lay hands on some people. Dora's down here, needs someone to come and lay hands on her. Sounds like that'll be me. Am I going to fall back? No. Oh, we, she has a hand, Sarah, that's good. And so to Nick and Debbie, everybody's got a hand. Hallelujah. All pray with me as I pray. Those who are laying on hands, let's pray and claim the healing for these people. Yes, Lord, we lift up your name. We speak over each one of these ailments in the name of Jesus. We speak over them in Jesus' name. 
Lord, your name is above whatever it is called. The name of Jesus sits higher above this sickness in Jesus' name. We say, body be healed. We claim the blood of Jesus. We claim the work of the cross over this person in Jesus' name. Be healed. Sickness be gone in the name of Jesus. Body be healed in the name of Jesus. Body come right in the name of Jesus. And if there's pain this morning, you go now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, and if it's something the doctor only sees, the next visit in the name of Jesus. Lord, there will be a great change towards healing in Jesus' name. We claim this in Jesus' name. We claim this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because he loves us. And that's the message that Pastor Neil was asked me to share. So the Holy Spirit has the message. So instead of Neil, it's Peter. But that's okay because the Holy Spirit's the one who does the delivering of the message. Amen. Amen. Compelled by love to love. And we're on this series of the fact that we have been sent, that we are, we are to go. You know, um, uh, I, I watched a message from New Zealand. Pastor Adam touched on this, that like we've all got like this apostolic call on our life to go. We tend to think there's just special people who are told to go, but we've all been told to go. We've all got ascending as a sense. We've all got something that God is sending us to do. And I've said it many times, I'm convinced that if you know Jesus and you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, the only reason you're not in heaven now, it's not because God wants you to have a good life down on earth. I mean, you'd like to have a good life down on earth. It's because he has something for you to do. Because the day you went to heaven and you get your new body and your new house, you won't regret it. I'm convinced some people have been prayed over to come back from the dead and those Christians have just said, no, I am not coming back. Because there are stories of Smith Wigglesworth raising his wife from the dead. She got up and she hit him in the head and said, never call me back from the dead again. I was with Jesus. How dare you bring me back? And he said, well, I needed a wife. And she said, if I go again, you're never to bring me back. I think sometimes we're hanging on this side, but once we hit the other side, we will say, I ain't going back. Sorry, guys, do without me. I'm not coming back. It's too good. So it's such a beautiful place. Why hasn't God taken us there sooner? Because he has a work for us to do. We're sent. And that's what the theme is that our leadership, yes, has brought us in. We're here for a purpose. We are here for a work. And Pastor Neil wanted us to get this point this morning. And because of limited time, I want to go, I guess, straight to that point that it's love that compels us. It needs to come from a place of love. It needs to come from an understanding of how much God loves you and his love for you is what compels you to then want to do what pleases him and to catch what's in his heart. I want to read a passage from 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. And it reads, But the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, because of that, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we, don't, we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us this word of reconciliation. So now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him... Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. This passage, earlier on in this passage, because, you know, like these are just long letters, yeah? Paul didn't put chapters or verses. So again, sometimes I feel like when I only read 14 verses, Paul's up in heaven saying, read the whole letter. Just make them wait. Read the whole letter. It's going to take a bit too long to read the whole letter, but I've just read part of his letter. He'd like to say, read the whole letter because you've got to get the whole picture. You know, when you read a little bit of a letter, you don't get the whole picture sometimes. When we were living in America, we got a phone call at two o'clock in the morning because Sonia wrote a letter saying how homesick she was and how hard it had been being there. And the person got to the second page and rang us, woke us up at two o'clock in the morning. I said, well, you should have read the rest of the letter because she goes on to say how much better it is and things are getting better and things are good. <laughs> but they just stopped at that and quickly thought, I'm going to go to the phone and ring Sonia now. Not thinking about the time America, Australia are really... We weren't, we sounded depressed because we were, it was two o'clock in the morning. So, 
Sometimes you've got to read the whole letter. And just before he says all this, Paul is talking about, um, he's described the amazing work that God has done in us through Christ. That, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels, he says, in jars of clay. That, that, that we, we have this treasure from God, this new life from God, but he says it's like it's been put in a tent. That our, that our life is just like a temporary house. That we have an outward life that is perishing, but an inward life that is being made new, more holy every day. And so he's described all this in the previous and said, and, and how that God has loved us and given us this brand new life, but let's accept the fact that we're living it in a difficult situation, in a tent, in an earthen vessel, in a house that's perishing on the outside while we've got this new life on the inside. And, and, he, and he describes that that is very challenging. But knowing that and knowing that people don't realize because they're, they're living in their outer house, he says, I'm compelled by the love of God, yes? Verse 14 says, for the love of Christ compels us. That word compels means it's got a tight grip on us. When something compels you, it has you and it kind of pushes you in a certain direction. And so Paul's saying the love of Christ just pushes me. It's got hold of me. It's got tight grip on me and it pushes me. This love from God is what compels me compels me and he says for the love of Christ compels us because we judge this we understand that if one died for all then all died we've come to understand that everybody died in Jesus everybody everybody died in Jesus John the Baptist pointed at him and said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world the sin of every man in this world has been already put on Jesus we need to remember that they're not really carrying their sin anymore it's been put on Jesus they're living in it, they're living in the consequences, they're living a lie. And, and that's why the Bible calls Satan the deceiver of the whole world. And sometimes he even uses Christians and preachers and condemnation and judgment and criticism to make people feel like they are still bound to this sin and, they, and they've got a sin problem. But the truth is, nobody really has a sin problem. They have a faith problem, they have an understanding problem. Their problem is they don't realise Jesus has taken it away already. He's already taken it away already taken it away some go to churches where they think that's not going to happen till I die that I don't get born again until I die but he's saying here and he says it in Romans 6 he says it in Colossians 2 Paul says it over and over again in Christ we already died so you are not waiting for your body to die to get born again Jesus body died so you could be born again Jesus died and so in him we've already dead yeah hallelujah and, and Paul saying this truth this truth, the love of God compels me to do something with this truth. Because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all are already dead. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 15, 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no man according to the flesh. Notice he says there, no man. I think he sees everybody in one of two camps. They're either in Christ or lost to the truth. But he doesn't regard them according to the flesh. He doesn't regard them as sinners. He doesn't regard them as too bad for God. Because he knows Christ has already made them good enough for God. They just don't know that. They just lost to the truth. And that's why Jesus talks about them as lost sheep. People that are lost. They're already made right in Christ. They just don't know that. They haven't laid hold of it. They haven't declared it. They haven't appropriated it. They haven't captured it. Which is what repenting is simply turning away from living as if I'm not right to living as if I am. And baptism is joining Jesus in his death and resurrection, Romans 6, Colossians 2, so that we are cut off, it says, cut off from that flesh. And we can now live in this new life, understanding, yes, I'm living in this old house, but I'm a brand new person. And, and this, he says, is just, it compels me. It compels me. Verse 15, he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So then he says, now we go on and we don't regard any man according to the flesh, no man, he says. Notice he says no one. Sometimes we think, oh, I just means you don't regard your brother or sister according to the flesh. But it actually says you regard no one according to the flesh. So that's the believer and the unbeliever. You don't meet somebody and say, this, here's a filthy sinner in front of me. Careful, that's not something you want to talk to God about. Because God doesn't see their filthy sin. He says, my son's already washed that away. The sacrifice has already been made for them. Yeah, they're going to stand before God to see what they did with that sacrifice. They're going to stand before God to see what they did with that sacrifice. But their sin has been paid for. That's why what they do with Jesus is so important. That's why I think the consequences of not accepting that sacrifice is so serious. 
Because it's huge. God gave his son for you. He came to an altar and he laid the, a lamb down in your place and it was his own son. And you're saying, that's not good enough for me. I don't accept that. That's a serious rejection. That's a big issue. But the issue is not what you've done because that's been dealt with. The issue is what we've done with Jesus. And so Paul says, I'm compelled to let people hear this and to get them to what? Reconcile to this truth. Reconcile means to make it come, come and reconcile to God. It's not about God reconciling to us, God coming down. Sometimes I think we think God came down. He came down and he became a man in Jesus Christ to defeat our sin to, so we can all be reconciled to God. You know, when you're, you think you're... In the old days, we used to have bank, bank accounts where we didn't, weren't able to go online and check our balance. I just started as a young man where we had that little checkbook or savings book and you had to make sure that any money in and any money out, you recorded it. But if you didn't record it, you thought you had more money in the bank. And sometimes people still do that. They're very quick with the card and they don't go and check and think, oh, I've got $300 in the bank. When the guy goes, bah, no money. The bank's done something with my money. But generally when you go and reconcile it to the bank, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that time, that weekend, oh, yeah. The money's all gone. You have to reconcile what, is, what you have as a record against what the bank has. And the bank's pretty much always right. One time, somebody took money out of my account accidentally. The bank did because we had a similar name. There was two Peter Thomases. And I was right and the bank was wrong. But that's once in my entire life. Every time I had to reconcile to the bank, the bank's always right. Not my balance, their balance. And so we reconcile to God. We reconcile to God. In Christ being reconciled to God. And that's why he finishes off with saying, He became sin who knew no sin, that we could become the righteousness of God. And so Paul's telling us here that he is compelled. He feels compelled to go and take this mission. But what compels him is the love of God. Paul's mission flows from the love of God. It flows from the love of Christ. This ministry of wanting to reconcile people to this flows from the love of Christ, the love of God. 1 John chapter 4 says, to know God is to love. To not love is to not know God. You know, if you have trouble loving people, you've got an issue with your your relationship with God. You've got an issue with understanding God's love for you. You've got an issue with understanding and walking in the love of God if you've got a problem loving people. It means I'm living in the problems of life. I'm living in the circumstances of life. I'm living in my challenges of life. And that's so hard. That tent, that earthen vessel and all its pressure is overwhelming me. I'm focusing on that and not on who I am in Christ and not on God's love for me. Because when you know the love of God, it says you'll love others. Love will flow out of you. And you'll be compelled by that love to want to do something about reconciling these lost people to the truth. You'll feel a responsibility, and that's the scent. But God wants to send us from a place where we, we are sent by his love. We're sent by his love, not just by some sense of guilt, or I'm bad, or I have to. Or so I can tell Pastor Neil all the people I spoke to this week, so he can tick me off. It's be, it should be coming from this understanding of God's love for us, compelled by the love of God, because to know God is to know love. Look a little bit off the script, sorry to, to um, Natasha who's up there trying to keep up, but um, I just want to share something. I've talked about it here before, and it's about the fact of God's love for us that we see in, in, the, in Adam, when God blessed Adam. Yes? Do you understand this that God made you for him to love you. Your purpose is to be loved by God. Your mission is to go and tell other people about him. Neil's talking to us today. He's, he's talking to us in this series about the mission, what we've been sent for. But today he wants us to know that comes from an understanding of what you've been made for, that you were made for love. You know, a lot of us have babies so we can love the baby. Then they grow up into a teenager and we're like, well, we had the baby. What happened to the baby? But... God made us so he could love us. He made us in his image so he could love us. I don't believe he made Adam just for the purpose of ruling the world. He told Adam to go and rule the world, but that's not the, that's not the purpose for which he made Adam. He made Adam for the purpose of loving him. God wants to love him. Made him to be loved, yes? Amen? So let me give you an example. Let me ask Ash to come up. He can be my Adam. Ash is our Adam for today. Amen. So maybe just have a sit on there, Ash.
And I've said it before, I believe that when God made Adam, male and female were in that body together. Because it says, one, one, uh, Genesis chapter 1, God made man, male and female, he made them in the image of God. And later on, when Adam didn't find enough friends in the animals, God took the woman out of man. Everything was created from the dust of the earth. Eve was not a new creation. She took him out of man. Took a rib, which represented the fact that he took her out. And Adam himself said, woman came out of me. So I believe that for you ladies today, when we talk about that first Adam in the presence of God, we're talking about male and female in one body. You were there, ladies. And so when God made us, again, that's why it says the two become one flesh. We come back together. We're two souls now, but we we make one flesh. And so here's God. He's made his Adam, and he created Adam in his image to be like him. And the scripture tells us that God blessed them and told them to go and gave them their mission. But the first thing he did was bless them. And that word bless actually means, it's barak in Hebrew, and it means to kiss, to bow before, to prostrate with. That's what God did. He didn't bless him with, I bless you, son, go. It wasn't some formal blessing. We kind of think of that. Or here's a little, here's a little lolly before you go. I'm going to give you a bit. He blessed him. And the barak means to kiss, to kiss, to hug, to adore him and say, oh, look at my Adam. I just love my Adam. Looks like me. He's a beautiful baby. He looks like me. God made us in his image to look like him because he wants to relate with you. I see my grandson Moses and I just want to get him and suck his face. So God just, I won't quite suck the face, but God just wants to hug us and adore us. He made you for him to adore you. He made you to be in his image. He made you to be in his image. And, and not taking on the knowledge of good and evil for ourselves was saying, I trust the image. I trust your guidance. You know what's right or wrong for me. Then Adam and Eve got tricked by the devil and he said, if you decide for yourself what's right and wrong, you will be like God. But they were already like God. That was a lie. And he's still a liar and he lies to all of us, by the way. Talk to the Holy Spirit to recognise how many times he lies to you in the day. He lies to you a lot. That's all he can do now. He can't touch you. He can only lie to you and get you to submit to something you don't have to submit to. He's a liar. And he lied to Adam and Eve and he stole this. But when Adam was made, this is what God, the first thing God did was bless him, adored him and kissed him. (laughs) And that's what God wants to do with you every morning. I believe every morning he waits for you. He wants to spend time with you. He thinks, James, before you turn to Steph, turn to me. And we'll spend some time together and you'll be a better husband for Steph. You're best to spend your first time with me. This is what God made us for. That Paul says, and that love compels me. It's that love that drives me. It's that love that affects my life. It's that love that makes me want to go and tell other people. Because that's what I'm reconciling them to. This isn't just a theological argument, yes? Yes? Lie down. We'll do this too. We're, we're running out of time. Just lie down. Lie down. Oh, we're doing the one. You're going to lie down. Yeah, lie down, lie down, lie down. Lie down. So God stood over Adam. You've got to lie down. Oh, the microphone. Sorry. God stood over Adam. You're not going to fall now. God stood over Adam and he made him from the dust of the earth. And so you can imagine it's all dust and and out comes Adam, you know. Pretty powerful moment. It's creating man, male and female in the one body. Says, go read Genesis 1. Male and female, he created them, it says, at that moment. Then later he separated. That's another story. I think that was Adam's mistake because it says Adam wasn't happy with God's choice of friends. He wanted to be like the animals rather than be like God. Because God is three in one. God is one. One Lord is a, is a, in Hebrew is a compound word. God's a compound one. Yeah? And so God makes him out of the dust of the earth and we kind of think he makes Adam and then he goes, Go! Fill the earth! Multiply! Some of us believe Satan's already on the earth. So we're saying, Go take the earth back for me. Go fill the earth with my holiness, with my image. I believe that's why we're here. We're here to be a problem to the devil, although we always say he's a problem to us. We're actually here to be a problem to him. And so he makes him out of the dust. Go. No, he doesn't say go. Barak means to prostrate yourself, to lie down. God got down and lied down. Oh, look at my lovely boy. Look at my image. Look at him. Oh, it's just so nice. He lied down with Adam. 
And he wants to lie down with you. Thank you, Ash. You're the sport, mate. <laughs> he wants to lie down with us. He wants us to know this. And he wants us to be compelled from that place to go and serve. He wants us to be compelled from that place to go and serve, to, to, to be sent. He wants to send us from that place of love. That's why Jesus said, go into the secret place. The Father waits for you there. He waits to barak with you. I know sometimes we go with the whole list of my mother, my father, my uncle, my auntie, my this, my that. I've got a whole lot of needs. And then God says, just that's okay, put that aside. Jesus actually said he knows what you need before you ask. He says, if you'll just go in and fellowship with him and barak with him, be blessed by him, adore him. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? God, the Bible comes across to us that God demands this worship. And we think of him as some sort of, I'm better than you, so you should worship me. No, he wants us to worship him because he worships us. He wants us to worship him because he worships us. He wants us to adore him because he adores us. We want to be adored by the one we adore. We want to be adored by the one we adore. And so then when you look at the lost and you realise all these people are Adams and Eves, lost to God and he just wants to embrace them and his heart longs for them and he stands down the end of the road like the prodigal son's father looking for them every day. Then Paul says, that, that the, love, the love of God, the love of God for me, the love of my father for the lost brothers and sisters, it compels me. It all comes from this place of this, it compels me. You know, that's very challenging for all of us. It's challenging for me. Even involved, as I said, we lead ministry and there's just constant, constant financial pressure, money pressure. Somebody's on a high, someone else is on a low. And you spend most of your di days dealing with the crisis, with the low, with the sad, with the struggling pastor or with the financially struggling part of the ministry. And it's just constant. You wake up sometimes and it's, what's the problem today or what's the challenge today? And, and it can get, it's, it's too much because there's times when you just need to do this, a need to be driven by this, not driven by the needs of the work, driven by love for God. Driven by love for God. So even preparing this message, it challenged me. I thought, yeah, so often I'm driven by what I see and need. And of course, I've got into this work, I would say, because I do love God and, I've, and, and made the sacrifice to be there out of my love for God. But sometimes then the work itself becomes the driver. The system, the program becomes the driver rather than I'm doing all this because God's love is just so wonderful. I'm doing all this because God's love is just so wonderful. That's, what, that's the place we need to come from. Our mission comes through love. Our mission comes through love. To see, to hear, to speak and to do just like Jesus. Jesus wants us to be like him, yes? Sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And we need to make space, we need to make time in our life to be saying to him, Holy Spirit, what, what do you want me to say? To say, Holy Spirit, what does Father want me to do today? Who do I, who do I need to smile at? Who do I need to give time to? Yes? And, and, and get out there amongst the unbelievers. And that's the challenge of this, this series from, from our, our pastor, Neil. I just want to read something Neil sent me. We are, where are all our unbelieving friends? There's another troubling statistic from some of the Barna Church surveys that 38% of church-going Christians don't have any non-Christian friends. This means even if we come to understand our personal role in evangelism, we might not have any friends with whom to share our faith. How do we get to this place as a church where we live in a holy huddle? Could we be so afraid of living of the world that we forget entirely about living in the world? Do we fear judgment from fellow believers if we spend too much time living in, uh, amongst the non-believers? Have we created the holy huddle by our own judgmental spirit? Or perhaps, perhaps we're simply following the path of least resistance. It is, after all, far less complicated to show up on a Sunday morning where we find a ready-made group of like-minded friends than it is to be intentionally cultivating new relationships. But church isn't a Christian country club and we were never meant to associate exclusively with believers. We are salt and light designed to flavour and preserve the world around us. Those already walking in the light don't need to discover a way out of the dark. If we're to imitate Jesus, then we must imitate him in his ease of living a pure life while associating with and frequenting the establishment of unbelievers. His calling is our calling, and his calling was clearly to non-believers. He said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Rather than judge one another for the time we spend with non-believers, let us encourage each other to live intentionally in the places God has entrusted to our care. Amen. 
It's challenging. And again, reading that yesterday, Neil sent it through to me. That's, that's challenging. Where's all my unbelieving friends? I'm too busy and all my friends are ministry related. What, what can I do to intentionally make more contact with unbelievers and, and, and go and show them the love of God through a smile, through care, through loving, through healing, through the power, through an encounter of that person having a, an amazing encounter with God. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22, Paul himself made great apostle. Said this, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as if I'm under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as one without law not being without the law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Hallelujah. I'll, I'll go and be, I'll do, I'll wear, I'll carry, I'll be accused or whatever. I'll do, I'll go, I'll do whatever I gotta be. He says, if I've if I got to go to those who are under law, then I'll submit to the law so I can come and meet them to Jesus. If I'm with those who are without law, I don't worry about keeping all the rules while I'm with them because I'm here to bring Jesus. If I, if, I'm, if I need to look weak or if I need to put myself in a weak situation so the weak can relate to me, I'll do that. The same could, go to, could be said with the strong or with the wealthy. The Lord wants wealthy people to, to be encountered by his gospel. Sometimes it takes a wealthy man to sit with a wealthy man just as much as it might take a humble, poor-looking man to sit with a poor-looking man for them to feel comfortable. All things to all men, he says, that I might win some. Compelled, though, by the love of God, coming from this love of God, coming from this place of the love of God. I just want to put up um, something else that Neil shared. It's from a man by the name of uh, John Tyson. His name's at the end. So if we, that's the last one. If we go, we start with, this is oh, oh, oh. comfort. That's where we start. Comfort is where you are a believer that's in the business of being a receiver. You choose a lifestyle that's easy and suits your natural desires. People don't really question that you're a Christian because not much of your lifestyle has changed. You take the scriptures that you like and you forget that there's others. And you know, often we've come to Christ initially because we're in a lot of pain and the gospel offers us comfort. And this is often our entry point. And this is a good entry point, that God has comfort for us. God wants to improve things in our life and get rid of the things in our life that are, that are a problem to us. But he doesn't want to re- remain us in, a, in that comfortable place. He hasn't left us here so for us to be comfortable. Heaven's for, for being comfortable. Heaven's for resting. It says it's our place of rest. He hasn't left us here where we're praying all the time, comfort me. Make me comfortable. Make it everything smooth for me. That's not why God left us here. He will smooth out the rough roads. He will bless us. He will care for us. He's like a dad. But really, a a parent that's aim is to make their child comfortable and happy at all costs is not good parenting. We all know that. You actually got to make them ready for the world. They've got to confront things they can't have. They've got to understand that sometimes things aren't comfortable. They've got to know that. Us grandparents, we're not very good because we just want to make them comfortable all the time. That's why they have parents. Parents have the job of, of, of letting their children deal with some discomfort in their lives. This, this gentleman says it's like a continuum. People start here and then we can move to the next one, which is caution. This is where you start taking your faith a little more seriously and people start to caution you. Be careful. You know, you don't want to offend them and you don't want to drive them away and you're this and you're that. There's all this, this caution. We get this caution You start believing God has a plan for you and wants to use you, but people around you notice and start to question and caution you because you're coming out of comfort and it's making them uncomfortable. The next phase, he says, is concern. This is where you start living the things God has put on your life and now your friends and family are concerned. She is really going on all that, on on all. She is really going on all on that Jesus stuff and people are concerned you are not like them anymore. Yes, but of course that was Jesus, wasn't it? That was his family, his own brothers. 
His own brothers got to a point where they kind of wished he was dead because he just was bringing shame on them. And he was, they, didn't, they didn't celebrate his ability to heal people. They were jealous. But of course, so was King David. King David had an anointing on his life and his brothers were jealous. People get concerned. After, criticism. That person who is a Jesus freak, way too committed and too radical, always can you tr- just focus on yourself. They now, now it's just open criticism. Because it's just too much, too much of a burden, too much is your concern about the lost, too much is your concern about bringing the kingdom of God to earth. And then finally, they're in the place of darkness because they're taking the light there. You find them often in the darkness because they're taking the light there. And people are like, he's out, he's out, he's in places he shouldn't be, he's in places he shouldn't go. And of course, you want to be strong by the time you go to this darkness. You've got to be not overtaken by that darkness or fall to that darkness. You've got to be strong in the Lord to be able to walk into that darkness. But we know Jesus did. He went to those wild parties. He went to where they were smoking drugs, where the belly dancer was probably coming through, belly dancing in his face. While he's trying to talk about the kingdom of God and everyone on one of those big pipe things with all the smoke coming out. My Lebanese family would know all about that. Jesus sat in that room. Half the room was high, half the room was drunk. There was sex in the side room and the belly dancer was coming through. And Jesus is in there and the Pharisees are outside saying, how dare he sit in there? That's an unholy place. The Lord wants us to go to unholy places. He wants us to, have, to talk to unholy people. He wants us to be in the darkness. But it, but it is. It, and, it, and this brother, he calls it a continuum because it's, there's always, this is always going on in the church. It's something you look, you'll find people in comfort, you'll find people in these different places. It's, it's a constant thing. And that's a good thing. It should be. But how many are stopping? How many people move beyond maybe the first one, comf- comfort, and then, then there's a genuine con- concern about the lost? A lot of us are concerned about the lost, but what are we doing? What actually are we doing? And so our senior pastor has challenged us, just make a decision. Just make some little steps. Just make some little steps to make a change. What can I do this week different towards this burden of the lost? What can I do that's different? But I guess I would also take you one step back. Do you know how much God loves you? Are you going to come away from this message and say, gee, I was challenged by Pastor Peter. I felt bad because I haven't done enough. But actually, I need, to, I, need to be, I need to be compelled by the love of God. That's the desire of our leadership of this church, is that we would be compelled by the love of God. Because any big evangelism, say, drive that comes out of impressing others isn't going to last. Because there's going to be criticism. There's going to be trouble. There's going to be people cautioning. There's going to be negative reaction. The devil does not want you in his darkness shining light. He's going to do something to drive you out of there. And so we've got to know that it's coming from the place out of love for God, not to impress men, not because I've got some sense of guilt or I went to Bible college, so I better do something. It's got to come from a place of love, knowing his love for you, compelled by his love for you. But having said that, we need to do something. If you know that love, then maybe this morning that love is speaking to you and saying, I just want... I want you to do more. There's something you could do. I, I want you to remember this. I just don't want you to forget this. Maybe you know how much God loves you and the pressures of life have pressed you down. Your mind is constantly full of tent issues, of perishing house issues. Because, friend, the house is perishing. We do live in a tent. It's all temporary. It's all going to pass. It all comes to pass. Don't worry. Bad times come and they'll pass. You're in some good times now. They'll pass too. Hallelujah. It all comes to pass, as the Bible says. Everything in this life comes to pass until the day we go and be with the Lord. And we're here on a mission to bring his kingdom. We're here on a mission to help others be reconciled to what we've been reconciled to. This truth of who we are in Christ, this this message of the gospel, reconciled even to the power of the cross to heal them. Maybe, and that's what I, I, again, I invited people this morning, be reconciled to that truth and keep telling your body, submit to that truth. Reconcile your body to the truth that Jesus came to heal you. I had really bad, four, five years ago, I had very bad arthritis pain in my, in my back. They told me I had, it just happened one day, going for my normal jog, my jog walk, I call it, and suddenly terrible pain running down my right leg. And it lasted for months, but I just kept praying. I got told, did a scan. The doctors just said operation or, you know, big shots of stuff. I just said, no, thank you. Just went and got massages and a bit of chiro. But in the end, it was just, I just kept coming to this altar. 
of saying, Jesus, you've healed this. You've healed this. I refuse to walk in this because I was only 55 and I thought I can't be taking these heavy painkillers for the next 20 years, planning to be around to at least 75. So I can't be taking these huge painkillers. It has to go. Well, it did go, didn't it? Didn't it go? And so I just argued and argued and argued. I argued for my healing. I argued for my healing because that's the, how much he loves us. I thought, you love me. You suffered. You had arthritis in your body, so I wouldn't. So I, this has to move. This has to move. This has to move. It was a very hard time. I w- I'd spent my summer holidays lying on the ground because that was the only comfortable place. And every other time I was in pain or popping painkillers, which makes you a little bit silly, yeah? And so it was no fun, but I just thought, I'm not, this has to go. This has to go. This has to go because he loves us. He loves us. And he wants us to know that love that that goes after that healing for us. And then, of course, then you think, I go for that healing in the other person. I want to just go for that healing in the other person. I just want to go after that healing. I want to claim it. I want to fight for it. I want to fight for Paxton to be totally healed, 100%. I want, I want it to be one day where, where there's a doctor saying, well, there is no sign of whatever that was. There is no sign. We don't know how that's happened. That he no longer carries any sign of anything that happened to him. Because Jesus carried it in his body. It's, as he carried Paxton's sin, he carried his sicknesses. And it says his infirmities, and that means frailty. So if this boy was born with some frailties, God carried those. Jesus carried those already. I, I, I want to fight for that because he loves us. You need to know how much he loves you. You need to know how much he loves you. Maybe this morning I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus that you don't know about. You're thinking, I don't even know what you're talking about. I thought church was this and religion. And I, I want to just tell you this morning, friend, that Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again from the dead so you could have a personal relationship with God. Michael said it so well on the communion. We took that communion to remind us that this is personal. We didn't take this communion just corporately to remember God loved everyone. And as Michael tried to express it, don't just, yeah, I know God loves everyone. No, God loves you. God knows all about you. He he knows how many heads you have on your head, hairs you have on your head. He loves me a little bit more than you because it's much easier to count mine. But he knows how many hairs you have on your head. That's how much he knows. He knows about it all. That means up in heaven, there's Peter Thomas, so many hairs, Sonia Thomas, a whole lot more. It's up there in heaven. He has it listed. Who would, I don't even know how many hairs. I'm not prepared to count. I love my wife, but I ain't counting all the hairs on her head. I mean, I love, I love my grandchildren, but I ain't counting the hairs on their head. I don't have time. I'm not interested. But God is interested. Mike has got too much hair to count anything. God is interested in the hairs on your head. That's how interested he is in you. That's the Barak. That's how, he, he, that's how much he loved the creation. That's how much he desires you. Do you know that love? Because that love will drive you towards what he's concerned about. And that's the others that don't know it. It will drive you. So we're just going to stand as the piano plays. And it's humbling sometimes to to come to an altar. But I just want you to make a move this morning. If you don't know Jesus, Mel's going to come in a little while and lead you in a prayer. So please, if you're thinking, I don't really know this Christ, you're welcome to come to the altar. And Mel's going to lead those in a prayer that, that haven't yet really understood Christ. Or maybe you need to commit to that baptism that joins yourself to the death and resurrection of Jesus. But for those of us that know him this morning, this altar is open. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, I need to walk afresh in your love for me. I need to be compelled by that love because my life's being compelled by my problems. It's my problems in the flesh that's compelling my life, that's directing my life. It's the challenges of my ministry. It's the challenges of my family that's directing my life. And that's why Paul wrote that chapter about all the troubles of the tent and the perishing outside. There will be challenges, but God wants our life to be compelled knowing how much he loves us. And maybe you just say, Lord, I need a fresh revelation of your love in my life. You confess that this morning. Or maybe you know that and you're just you're saying, Lord, I commit to do more, to do what is on your heart. I commit, Holy Spirit, to making even the smallest change in this coming week that's going to be towards the bringing of the kingdom of God. Maybe you're just going to pray. You're going to stop praying for yourself and your family and pray for the lost. Maybe you're going to you're going to target someone. Maybe you're going to pause and ask the Lord. Maybe you're going to pray for everyone in your workplace that you haven't prayed for because one day they will all stand before the throne of God. They'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Something, something towards the reconciling that's in God's heart to those that don't know him. The altar's open. You come. As Pastor Peter mentioned, we're going to just take a moment for anybody who doesn't have a relationship
worship with Lord to really step out and be bold today. Like we've heard this morning how beautiful it was that God sent His Son from heaven to come down on earth to take on all our sin and all our shame. He took that on the cross for us just so that we might have choose Him, so that, so that we might want a relationship with Him. He did that all for you today. I believe there are people in this room that feel a tug on their heart. And as a family, I'm just going to ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. And if that's you this morning, if you're just feeling a tug, something different, you've heard something that just keeps on ringing in your ears, to just put one hand on your heart and raise your other hand. Be bold. I see you. Thank you. Be bold. And I just want to speak this over you. In Romans 9, um, verse, sorry, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we're going to take a moment. I'm going to speak a prayer. And I just want you to repeat after me. And what you're doing in this moment is believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the death, from death, and that you are now saved, that you can step into this freedom, you can step into this liberty, that Jesus died for you and that he offers for you. All right, so as a family, we're just going to say this prayer. And if that's you this morning, just leave your hand raised. Reach out to God today. Dear Lord Jesus, I know this morning I am not perfect. I confess to you, Lord, that I need you in my life. I believe, Jesus, that you are the one and only way. I need this compelling love. right now I invite you into my heart from this moment on Lord I put you as number one in Jesus name Amen how good is God congratulations to anyone that said it for the first time